Welcome to what is the Apple II Pi hardware implementation. And I wanted to show you the progression that the Apple II Pi hardware has kind of gone through over the years, just so that you could uh, perhaps better understand some of the design trade-offs and why things ended up being implemented the way they were or are. And... Uh, give you just a little bit of background and, and uh, understanding of the actual architecture. Originally, there was a post many years ago talking about connecting the Raspberry Pi when it was very first uh, iteration, when it was first announced, with an Apple II and how that connection might look like. There's a lot of discussion and various ideas thrown out about what the correct connection architecture should look like. So I thought that was a pretty interesting idea. So I dug out uh, my Apple II hardware reference manual and uh, looked at the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi and how one would go about programming them. And my solution was to connect the two machines using a, the UART, the serial interface. Kind of the reasons I came up with this as a solution involves the simplicity of such a connection and that the Apple II has easily available serial cards, and the Pi has a UART connected right on the GPIO pins. So the very first iteration of the Apple II Pi involved the, an Apple II C connected to the Pi. And the Apple II C has a serial port here that I connected with some converters to a USB RS232 dongle, which would then connect right into your Raspberry Pi USB port. Shortly thereafter, I took that same idea after developing a very preliminary version of the software that would allow the keyboard of the Apple IIc to send keyboard input directly to the Raspberry Pi through the serial port and implementing a little daemon that would run on the Pi as a Linux daemon server injecting the key presses into the Linux input subsystem. This would show up then as a standard keyboard to Linux and allow me to then control Linux through the Apple II keyboard. So I took this concept to the next step, which was to use the Apple Super Serial Card plugged into an Apple IIe. Now the now, the Apple II Super Serial Card looks just like, from a software perspective, the serial port on an Apple IIc. So, the software did not have to change. I just connected the serial port of the Apple II then to that same USB dongle on the Raspberry Pi. So that was a very simple conversion from the Apple IIc to the Apple IIe. Then I thought, well, wouldn't that be cool if the Apple II actually contained the Raspberry Pi internally? And so what about taking a prototype card and implementing just enough of the 
super serial card onto the proto card and connecting the Raspberry Pi to the proto card. So my first prototype here is a very minimal implementation. That was the idea was to take the bare essentials of the super serial card and transplant it to the prototype card and have it talk directly to the Raspberry Pi. So I kind of came up with this solution where this would plug in and the whole thing kind of just sat here and it did work. One thing to note, there's only two chips on the proto card. The super serial card is fitted with a lot more hardware and that's because it's a full featured serial card. It has a ROM, has the 6551 serial chip, it has supporting hardware for the RS-232 protocol, which is based on uh, negative 12 and 12 volt signals. Plus it has all these little dip switches over here, which this, the, the firmware will, will read to set the, the protocol settings. And it has a crystal oscillator here for the for controlling the baud rate generator in the 6551. So this is the basis for all the timing uh, from the serial chip. Now if you notice, the prototype type card only has the serial 6551 chip, just a 7404, and nothing else really. It's all just wires and some resistors and caps. How I was able to get rid of almost all of this supporting circuitry is by obviating the need for the ROM chip here and removing the requirement for this crystal oscillator by actually programming up one of the GPIO pins to output the same frequency as this crystal oscillator that would feed into the serial chip providing its baud rate generation. So I was able to really reduce the amount of required hardware to implement the serial interface. The 7404 is really just uh, a bare bones uh, buffer is used as a buffer and as the chip select for the 6551. One thing to note, the 6551 is a 5 volt device. When plugged directly into the Raspberry Pi, you have to switch voltages. The Raspberry Pi runs on 3.3 .3 volts. If you were to blast your 5 volts out of the serial chip right into the GPIO pin of the Raspberry Pi, you blow the circuit out. So on the back here, we actually have what's called a voltage divider, which just takes that 5 volts and with two resistors and taking the signal from between the middle of them, it will output 3.3 .3 volts instead of 5 volts thus saving our <laughs> Raspberry Pi from being blown up. So this was all well and good for quite a while. I had a lot of fun with it, but never really thought doing much more than making a fun little project just for myself. Well, I got contacted by some Apple II friends and uh, got me in touch with Ultimate Apple II who said they might want to actually make a production run of boards based on my prototype and uh, I make them available to the general Apple II community. I said, well, sure, why not? It's a pretty simple board and uh, shouldn't require too much. So the first thing to do was to really try to figure out what is the best way to mount a Raspberry Pi to an Apple II plug-in card 
which would work well with other cars and be a, a simple thing to manufacture um, and just make it a cleaner, more reasonable plug-in card for the Apple II. So after a few hours of playing around with how I was connecting this thing, I realized the best way to connect it is to actually flip the Pi around so that it would plug directly into the prototype card and it would just make for a cleaner configuration. So Anthony at uh, Ultimate Apple II and James Littlejohn uh, got to work on laying out a board based on the prototype that uh, would switch the direction of the Raspberry Pi, how it interfaced, put a little header on there. And again, this is the Raspberry Pi 1. This was the original one that everybody would buy back in the day. And this was our first version of the card to try everything out on. And it basically just takes this prototype card, puts it on a Apple II, you know, laid out PCB card, and it makes for a nice little uh, plug-in environment. The HDMI comes out the bottom and you could go at 90 or 270 degrees. The USB and Ethernet ports come out the front. The only thing that would be difficult is if you wanted to use the composite or audio jacks because they would now hit the lid of the Apple II case, but that was the trade-off made in doing it that way. So this was an interesting uh, step, step in the development of the Apple II Pi. As it came to production, we thought, you know, it might be reasonable to have the ability to not just only plug the Raspberry Pi directly into the card, but have a pigtail out the back of the case so that you could plug in your Raspberry Pi there and then you could have access, easy access to the ports on the Raspberry Pi. So for that production run, we added this, this nice little pigtail. Again, most of the layout is all the same. Only one little bodge wire there. And so this is basically what came to pass as the first version of the Apple II Pi card that was sold. Now, unfortunately, the, about the moment we sold this card, the Raspberry Pi Foundation switched their header configuration from this 23-pin uh, or 24-pin setup to a 40-pin setup. So now things didn't fit quite like they used to when you would plug in your new Raspberry Pi into the Apple II Pi card. Your HDMI port now is in line with the actual slot connector on the Apple II. So this caused problems. You could really only put the Apple II Pi in slot seven and have a 90 degree exit on the HDMI for it to have any chance of fitting in the Apple II. So a few years later, we got it back together and uh, came out with a, a slightly more updated version of the card that still basically the same thing but now, when you plugged in your new Raspberry Pi, the HDMI port clears the Apple II connector so that, again, you can use the 90 or 270 degree angle on your HDMI to, uh, to clear other cards and chips and whatnot in the system. So this ended up being the last real version of the Apple II Pi for years, basically. But about the time we did this version 4.5, Ultimate Apple II 
realize that our supply of working 6551 cereal chips was drying up and it was more and more difficult to find a strong good supply of these cereal chips. So the Western Design Center who builds the current modern version of this 6551 cereal chip introduced a bug in their current design that pretty much kills any use of that ship in a, in a production environment. It, uh, uh, the technical details kind of go on. But the other idea we had was to have a boot ROM on the card so that with the current product, you'd have to have a boot floppy that was required to load the software on the Apple II side so that it could send the keystrokes and mouse movements and other protocol over to the Raspberry Pi, which was fine, but it, it made for a less than integrated solution. So I really wanted a ROM chip, much like the Super Serial card has on it, so that you could boot directly from the Apple II Pi card. So this Super Serial card actually has a custom EEPROM on it with boot code for Apple II Pi. So this is how, again, prototyped the boot ROM in order to have a card that could boot directly into the Apple II Pi client. So between losing our steady supply of 6551s and wanting to add a boot ROM, Anthony went and commissioned a custom chip, a CPLD that would combine the pieces of the 6551 that we use for the Apple II Pi, plus some additional circuitry to control a ROM chip. So this was all done oh, back in 2015 or 2016, I, I believe. And it was a product that um, it just kind of languished. After a few years, Anthony thought, well, I'd like to get back and kind of revisit this project and uh, try and recoup some of the development costs that uh, he'd put into it. So um, I got this in the mail one day and this card has the custom chip, the CPLD, implementing all the uh, 6551 and ROM control. Here is the actual ROM and bus driver, all these are running at uh, 3.3 volts. So we have to do uh, some level shifting so that uh, we don't blow anything up. But again, it's a very nice, simple, clean looking card. And our Raspberry Pi, once again, just plugs right into the back here so that uh, You get a nice, clean design, and that will be the next iteration of the Apple II Pie card. So that's sort of how the generations of Apple II Pie hardware kind of came to be. What's interesting is that all versions are software compatible, so there is no difference in the actual software that runs on the Apple II side or the Raspberry Pi side. It all is backwards and forwards compatible. That was one of the main goals I wanted as the person writing all the software, as I didn't want to have to have different versions of the software based on different hardware revisions. I wanted it all to be software compatible. So everything from our super serial card to our Apple IIc to this latest version of the Apple II Pi card are all 
software compatible. So I hope that explains a little bit about the evolution of the design and how it came to be. One of the benefits of using the Super Serial card the, as your Apple II Pie card is that you don't have to connect it just to a Raspberry Pi. Since it's just a standard RS-232 interface, it means you can connect to any other computer running Linux that has an RS-232 interface on it. In this case, here we have an old Mac Mini that is running Ubuntu. So in this machine, I will take my Super Serial card with the custom boot ROM, plug it into my Apple IIe, and that will then use the Mac Mini running Ubuntu as the main computer. So a little pause here. Okay, the Super Serial card is in slot 7 uh, with the boot ROM, and the reason for that is the Apple II will scan from the highest slot down to the lowest slot looking for a boot image. And that's what our custom ROM in the Super Serial card provides. So we'll just button this up real quick here. Slide it back. And we'll turn it on. And now we have basically the same thing as the Apple II Pie, but we are now using the Apple II mouse under Ubuntu, just like we would see with the Apple II Pie. We call this, oh, I don't know, the Apple II Mac or something? I'm not sure. But my uh, Apple II keyboard is all connected, and uh, we can interact with our much more powerful computer, just like we would the Pi, but with uh, a, a real computer, so developing software and running higher powered programs is a, is a much more pleasant experience. More memory, more CPU, all that. So that's the benefits of using a standard serial connection to connect to a larger or different computer uh, comes into play. It doesn't just have to be you know, a regular PC running Ubuntu. Here's another computer I like to connect to it. This is a an NVIDIA Jetson computer. It's a ARM-based with a, a nice little GPU on it. And this thing runs a nice uh, version of Ubuntu as, as well. Nice and fast, probably almost as fast as the, uh, as the old Mac Mini here. Uh, that it's based on the ARM chip, makes it a little more of a appropriate 6502 uh, descendant than, than the Intel chip. But again, you can connect just about any computer running Linux to your Apple II using the standard serial interface. Just one other option you have, uh, if, if you're so inclined, so, Keep that in mind. Thanks for watching. Our next installment will get a little bit more into the software side of things and again kind of support why the design looks the way it does.